recording. Thank you. <laughs> um, so off to Malvika to talk about setting up projects. Thank you, Brasile. Those who would be watching this, this is our second call and we're very excited to continue on and have you all return back. We didn't scare you off, that's great. Um, I see that there are some people who couldn't join last time are here, and we also have a couple of mentors joining us for refresher, or just to see who you all are and meet you all here. Um, I'm going to share the screen and um, give you a short intro for what we're gonna do today. So today's session is about tooling for open collaboration. Although we would be talking about the technology and platform we're gonna to use today, our choices should be informed by the idea of collaboration. This is the, sec this is the fourth step of the call. Um, and of course we have kind of skipped the mentor mentee so far. And some people have asked me when will I get to know about our mentors? We are very close and you would actually receive an email from us tonight, tonight for me, but like later in the day for you. So we are here for tooling for collaboration. Some of you also went to the GitHub uh, training yesterday, and I heard that you all had a lot of fun. So I hope that you can put some of those skills into practice and those who couldn't go and still need some help, we will be doing that today. Our purpose or aim uh, of this call is to help set up an open and welcoming project repository online or shared for your project so can so that you can work effectively with your team your community or your con contributors the learning objective is at the by the end of the session you should be able to write a readme file with information you would like others to know you should also be able to explain to others uh, why you need an open source license and you should be able to choose one for your own project we will also talk about contributors guideline and code of conduct. Um, and we hope to have some conversations around that. So by the end of the call, you would start choosing a code of conduct that you would like to have attached to your own work so that other people, including your team members or broader contributors feel welcome and safe. So what we did last time was finishing our call on roadmap. We did a lot of work last time. So first, if you would, Scroll up on the document, you will see you set up your vision, you set up some of your goal, um, you are doing open canvas to understand different resources and more. And we finished with asking you to think about what should be your roadmap for the next three to four months, or if you would like to attempt much more longer. So we had open canvas, short and long-term goal. Today, we will be talking about README, which is basic documentation you would require to communicate about your projects. This is where a lot of information that you worked on last call should sit. Second is code of conduct and third license. We would probably switch up at the order a little bit, but these are the three things that we will cover today. With that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, and those who are just joining, you would find a shared document in the chat. And we're just introducing what we're gonna do today. Okay, and with that, I think we will send you in a bit to a breakout room to discuss different things, including the platform that you would like to choose for yourself. There is a prompt starting in line number 107, 210. Graciela, that was too fast. Was it enough time for a breakout room? I'm still setting it up. So people okay, please ask questions. <laughs> perfect. I, I know, like it, it takes a bit, bit time with, uh, bigger group. So when we say set, choosing a platform, a lot of us by default have either used, and when I say us, it's OLS team, has used GitHub or GitLab. It's an online platform that a lot of you are familiar with. But some of you who don't code may not have seen GitHub before. You actually had the chance to learn about it yesterday, or if you haven't yesterday attended that training, we would share the resources. And we recommend that you actually check it out. But I don't want you to change your complete workflow. You can think about, let's say, if you are working on Google Drive, how can you create Google Drive that can have access for other people? If you don't want to have 
access to other people for your Google, Google Drive, you might want to think about setting up a simple web page where the information can be shared. It could be something else. Some of my colleagues have set up SharePoint because their organization work with Microsoft. Um, and then there are different ways to organize. There are many, many different platforms that you can choose from depending on where you're working, who you're working with. But the idea is, can you make them open, accessible for people who you want to work with, who should know about your work, who should be able to engage with your work and hopefully involve and contribute. So think about what that might be. Um, before we actually send you off in discussing that, are there questions in the room before we head out for breakout room? This could also be a chance to ask about things that you did last time uh, that raised some questions. Yes, Jane, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to find out, I'm not sure maybe I was lost at some point. Um, the final presentation, is this supposed to be part of what we're doing now? So the whole mission statement um goal because for some of the exercises i i i do a lot of reflections and um and jot things down on my notes not necessarily using the uh platform or template but you know just getting me to think about it and so i just wanted to know what yeah. is, is supposed to be part of the final, final present. presentation uh, you'd be surprised how little we ask you for final presentation. In the final presentation, we ask you to prepare five minutes presentation, sharing highlights, learning, challenges, and anything that you would like other people to know. We want you to use this five minutes to just celebrate the success. Um, another part of like, you know, it's completely fine to take your notes, reflection. I do a lot of handwritten things, but there is one phrase I use a lot that, um, you should document things in a way that other people can understand what you're doing if your intention is to work openly. And I know sometimes it means that it requires that you go back and synthesize some of your notes into some concrete ideas. Um, so it's it's like write the documentation because nobody can read your mind. So you don't have to share everything, but try to document stuff, and which is what we are doing today. So Jane, don't worry about the final presentation. We're here to learn. And this learning is more important than what you would talk about in your final presentation. Awesome. Our Graciela is ready. Um, you have 10 minutes, right? Yes. Try to set the break. Thank you. <laughs> we would try to set the breakout rooms in a way that you can move around. Because some of you, if you don't rename your speaking or writing preference, we might end up sending you to a wrong room so you can actually see and move to the right room yourself. You would have a little bit flexibility to make multiple friends in the same call. You had a lovely chat. Can I get some idea or consensus for what are some platforms you were hearing in your room? You can either put it in the chat or raise your hand and tell us. Yes, Moses. Yeah, I wasn't familiar with um SharePoint, and um it's 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 something that one of um my colleagues brought up, and I was very happy to hear about that. Um, together with GitHub and then Google Drive. So yeah. Yeah, SharePoint can be very tricky if you work in an organization because they always have access limit. But one of our colleagues actually did a really beautiful job with using SharePoint because they can't share information too openly because they work for a sensitive project. So I can, you know, no shade. We are not open source purists here. Whatever works for you to communicate your work. So I'm glad that you found some example. Amir. Yeah, so the other one I mentioned that was also important is um, Drac has their own wiki. Um, so when it comes time to hosting instructions on maybe how to use your software or to the tools or packages or whatever, uh, Drax Wiki is pretty much uh, the main source 
for, for running on the Canadian clusters. Um, and uh, it, you know, that has all the information on how, what packages to preload and, and things like that. So I think that's a pretty important place to put um, the guide or, or if you will, um, because that's what they do for things like Python. They tell you what, what to install, et cetera. Perfect. Can you drop us a link somewhere? And yeah. also GitHub has wiki too. Um, and I totally agree. If you're working on a project with multiple documentation and manual, um, you, and you want to separate them, Wiki could actually work quite nicely. I also see a lot of favor for GitHub, Drive. Very cool. Wonderful. Thank you all. Um, and I hope that you probably have some option for what you want to do. We're going to move on to the next part, unless there's some insight. You don't have to share a platform. Is there any insight you want to share from your own discussion? Thing. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, something that came up from our discussion was that um, it may not be possible to always share um the work you are doing mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you may also want to protect it from other people stealing your ideas and running with it faster than you do uh, uh maybe with better funds and a larger team but we acknowledge the fact that um the idea of even putting out the work in summary out there to get some contributors or opinions or something is also a good practice and with that, I wanted to just find out from you the best way to do that. So is this something you could just do on, for example, your social media pages? Is that enough sharing or do we need to create um, um, and then with a contact to say, OK, um, if you have more information or if you want to contribute to this, please email this or contact this and then probably also put it on the website uh, yeah. of your institution. Is that enough? Oh, do okay. we need um, those are amazing questions. And they, that made me smile because that's a question that that's what we, we think we want to debunk. I, I personally don't agree, but completely like take my word as that Malvika's opinion, not world's opinion. Sharing something does not make it stealable. Your ideas are executable by you and not everybody. And if you're working towards knowledge production, how does it matter that someone else is going to do it? But I completely see that when you're like in academic, academia, you want, you're working towards a thesis for three years, or sometimes you may have some apprehension. But during the cohort, we will share some of the methods like pre registration, registered report, preprint, to make sure that you are able to share your information with the details of yourself. So, so people know that you were the first person who talked about it, or you were the person who talked about it. Um, so first of all, I think we want to make sure that over the few weeks we talk about the fears of, you know, what if I share things and it gets stolen? And we want you to get comfortable with, you know, where can I share what I want to share? Because ultimately it's your choice what you would like to share. Um, so you need to make decision around why something needs to be protected. And there could be sensitivity, confidentiality, you know, indigenous data, indigenous knowledge, protection of whatever you need, sure, 100% protect them. But if there are information which is going to benefit a lot of people without depriving anyone or without harming anyone, you should ask yourself, why am I not sharing? And where do you share is completely up to you. Uh, the reason why, you, why we are asking you to choose things like GitHub is because it's one thing to write something and put it out there to get people to read. The next step is to get people to engage and then get involved and work with you. So you should choose a platform where rather than one directional knowledge giving, you actually involve people in co-production collaboration. So think about the platform where you are able to do that. And that's not to say you shouldn't write blog post or shouldn't be on the website. You should totally do that. But always think about what can I do to get people engaged with me and where can I engage with them? So. All of those questions you're asking, Jane, keep thinking about them because those are some of the work that you're going to do with us. And you would choose the right.
platform for yourself, right level of information you would like to share, right level of information information you would like to protect, ensure that people are giving you attribution for the work that you are doing. I hope that helped. Um, having said that, I'm going to share a blog post just talking about it, which I, I hope you can read and uh, appreciate at some point because it talks about exact fears that you were talking about. Sorry, Graciela, I'm running slightly over, but I'm going to hand it over to you now to talk about Read Me. It's completely fine. This is a great discussion to have. Uh, we are now heading to line 176 of our frame of edge. Let me just set things up here to start presenting. Okay, let me share the screen. We are going to talk about readmes. Um, okay, I see you see my screen. Not if, okay, cool. <laughs> let me move things around a little bit. Okay, um, so let's talk about readmes. It, it connects to this discussion we are having right now because it's the main document or the main landing page which summarizes your project. Um, so readme's are documents or pages or any kind of documentation that welcomes people to your project. You say hello to them, you say, hey, we are do here doing this for you. And they also are a document to orient and encourage participation and collaboration. So in this document, you're going to have a welcoming message and also all the information needed for someone just getting to know your project to be oriented and guided within the, your project and to feel encouraged to either use or collaborate with you. Uh, so. As I said, what's a README? A README is the first stop for visitors, it's the first thing that they see. Uh, in a GitHub repository is a document that is really highlighted in the list of uh, files or on a website is the landing page. Um, there are different formats that you can use. Um, it's, as I said, it's found in the root directory of your repository. Um, sometimes we also use README inside subfolders but also in the kind of root directory of that subdirectory to have a disclaimer about what that folder is about, how can you interact with it. So it's a really important document. If you're working with software, with data, you're going to have to do that all the time. Um, and it's usually written all caps. That's historical, like it's a convention in the open source software world where we have these documents that are really important, they're written in all caps, so we know they are about documentation and they are very important to read. What is not a README? Um, so a README is not something that is super um, vague and short, <laughs> and also it's not a comprehensive documentation of your project, it's not like, every single detail of your project um, and is not also the only document or documentation for your project. So the README is kind of a summary, as I said, it's like a welcome mat for your project. It contains important information, but it's also not super, super extensively detailed. Um, and it does connect to other documents in your project. Um, so one thing that is important when writing a README is to connect to your audience. So you need to know who your collaborators and your contributors are and who your users are so you can write in a way that connects with them and invite them and encourage them to, uh, to keep around, to explore more your, your project. Uh, so that's that connects to our previous call when we created the open canvas and we thought about those general um, target audience, let's say, um, and we need to revisit that to create a README. Um, so the process to write a README, now that you have an open canvas, you can uh, take those three elements of your open canvas to help you write a README. So you have the users, the contributors, and your vision statement. There are other elements of your Open Canvas that you can use to read 
to write a readme as well, but those three I thought were the most striking important because the first two users and contributors will be your target audience. You're gonna write for them. You're gonna write with them in mind. And then the vision is the main thing that you need to communicate right away uh, on top of your readme, like it's the main message. Uh, you start your readme by saying why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, because that is going to keep people reading and engaged with your project. Uh, so kind of a small recipe for readme. First, you say hello, you welcome people to the project, and then you write a small project description that is clear, but it's also succinct. Um, you explain what makes your project special, useful, and exciting. So this is related to your value proposition and also your, what's it called? It, yeah, unique value proposition and your vision statement. Um, then you show how to get started using or contributing the, to the project. So you link or direct people to exactly how they can start using your project or what's the main thing that you need help with. Um, and then you state what resources are most needed. So that connects to the canvas as well, like the bottom part where we have the resources needed. Um, that's also summarized in the readme. Oh, and if you go to the slides, there are some links that you can click. This, uh, you can read more about it in this Mozilla Leadership training series. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what else might be important to add to a landing page? Imagine you're uh, you just got to, like yesterday, I found out about this calendar scheduler kind of service. Um, what is the, what are the things that I needed to know when going to their website to engage with their products? You can put in the chat or a mute. Any ideas? Motivation, yes. A catchy name. That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. So maybe it's a, it's a moment for you to rethink your, your project name. If it's too long, maybe you, will, you want to make it more catchy so people feel more attracted to it. Contact info of the project coordinators, exactly. Because you're, you want people to engage with your project, but then how do they do that if you don't have contact information or ways of communication, right? Perfect. What else? Significance. Yes. That's related to the motivation. Also the unique value proposition, right? They are all connected. Anything else? No? Yeah. Field of application, expected results. Yeah, those are good examples. The most important outcome, vision. Yeah. Yeah, that's those are more I, I can see like scientific research going in <laughs> in these things. Um yeah, I can see like a GitHub repository with a readme and people stating what are the expected results and the most important outcome. Um, yeah, that's good. And that relates to also other fields of open science with pre-registrations and reports and things like that. So yeah, really good. Let's move on. Maybe your project progress so far. Yeah, that's a good thing. So you have your goals and you have your roadmap. You can link that to your readme as well and people will know where your project is at. If it's just launched, if it's you know, it's just an idea or you have already 20 years of product. Um, and a little about you, that's a good thing. Share links to different important, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's move on. So those are things that you can put, you know, read me as well, uh, depending on where you're storing it. Uh, so for example, on GitHub, you have this ability to include GIFs, badges, emojis, translations, and you use this language, this formatting language called Markdown, where you can change the formatting of the, the words. So depending on where you're going to store your readme, 
you're gonna be able to explore and we highly recommend that you explore those visuals um, thinking on your target audience and trying to attract them and keep them around so a readme is a living document as well and it must evolve with your project so you have initially a readme at this stage that you're uh, just thinking about the formats what's going to be but then 10 years from now your project is already mature it has maybe changed the target audience and you you don't need to write a readme and never touch on it again so it's okay to have a draft next week you change your mind and you write it again and 10 years from now you adapt it to the new reality Keep that in mind and it's important to also update with new information if your contact information changes if the the state of the project project changes things like that so keep in mind that it's a living document um so let's take a look at the uh, readme on github so this is an example of a project this is a readme and on github you're gonna see if you have a, a file a markdown file uh, with the the name of the file is readme is going to show up in your landing page of your project so it's going to be right there uh, is the is going to be the first thing that people will see um, and see here you see there's a welcome message here with emojis visuals and all that there's a small project description and a short sentence summarizing what's what the project is about and here there are links to all the sections in the readme and there are links to how people can get involved code of conduct license and everything that is important for that project um, what are the examples of readmes we can think of can you think of other formats of documents or pages applications <laughs> that could be considered a readme User manuals, yes. What else? What's it? SOPS. I don't know what it is. Hmm. Standard operating procedure. Yeah, ah, okay, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, I can imagine this. Yeah, uh, Jane, you have your hands. Yeah, just to bring it to my discipline. So, um, will a, will an abstract, <laughs> will an abstract is some revised um, version of your work be considered a readme? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I think it can be in some ways because it summarizes your thing, your project, um, it has the status of your project, but, uh, it doesn't have other informations like how people can contribute because it's already a closed product, but it, it could be considered a readme, I would say. Yeah. Ijoma? Uh, I wanted to add, well, is it actually add, ask? If an abstract, I don't know, maybe maybe different from law discipline, but I know that in my discipline, abstract is typically two hundred to three hundred words. Yeah. <laughs> and and the way that we we write the abstract, you maybe one sentence on your background, your objective, your methods, your results, mm -hmm. and all that. I don't know how it works in law, so I'm wondering if that can actually serve as as a readme <laughs> or yeah. does it mean because typically our abstracts is written after the project is completed yeah. or at least some aspect of the project so mm -hmm. um, using it as a format of a readme for a project that is just starting I'm just wondering the best way that that can be represented just thinking out aloud 
Yeah, that's a that's a good point because the abstract is written after the project is completed. That's Not necessarily. There are abstracts that are written before the project. So in the mm -hmm. social sciences and in law, I'm sure Chie Dozier maybe from is from that background. So maybe I'll let him talk if I add more. Dozy? Yeah, some abstracts can be written, but at, at that point, it may be called well, executive summary because at that point, you don't have, um, what is it called? You don't have a result. And that is what most of these um, grants funders, when you've written whatever thing you, you, you've written, they will tell you to make a lay, a lay summary or an executive summary that someone can just read and have an overview of what you intend to do. So it may not necessarily be called an abstract. You can call it executive summary if it is um, meant for um, professionals in your area or a lay summary if it is meant for everybody to read and understand. Mm -hmm. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I love this idea as well on the chat that people said that YouTube hands-on video for installing and testing products. I think that's a great thing. Yesterday I was thinking that I, I subscribed to a recipes magazine and I felt like it was at each recipe was a read me because it has an engaging language. It makes me want to cook that recipe and it has instructions, <laughs> you know, so it, it kind of has a read me. Um, Frank, do you want to share? Can you hear me? Okay, so just on the issue of abstract. So I think if I'm going to use abstract as um to put as a readme for my data, for example, I might not necessarily put um you know the abstract verbatim the way it is. So I could just pick you know turn the abstract to like kind of a process, just replicate the um readme template kind of right, and so pick things that are kind of we show the person this is the process how I actually get to do this research. And of course, if you see that research has not been conducted, like she does say, sometimes you could have an abstract that's where you are having a research and not actually conducted as many people do in conferences to submit an abstract ahead. And then before the conference, they come up with the paper they can now present, right? But for me, I think in, in README, it is it's important to kind of see the, 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 the template that README normally follow to show kind of a process and so it's easier if you have an abstract and then convert that abstract kind of a process it will kind of be more relatable that's my view yeah 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 um so we're gonna have exercises just in a few minutes that maybe will clarify all that <laughs> um so let's move on uh and in, in these slides there are several examples of readme's that you can get inspiration from um, there is a cheat sheet on how to use Markdown on GitHub. There is an emoji reference website. Um, there is a list of awesome readmes. I highly suggest that you visit it. And think of, uh, in terms of your project, where you want to host it and what the format of your readme will be, what will be more appropriate for your project. So let's pause and see what questions do you have so we can move on to our activity. None? Yes, Moses. Can you please come again on our there's one point under the guide, and when talking about a guide for the README, uh, where you have how to get started, like what did you mean? Oh, uh, okay. Um, so the main points that you. Yes, there is one point that says how to get started. If you can come again on that, I didn't get what you meant. Guide the guide for writing the README. Oh, okay. Okay, let me share the screen again so we can explore together. Is that what you mean? No. We have a, we have a reference, um, Graciela. Yes, this one. Yeah. Oh, this yeah. one. Okay, yeah. yeah. Show how to do that, yeah. Yeah, um, so these are some points that are important for you to hit, to have in your readme. Uh, you have to have a 
kind of on the top a welcoming message say hello and welcome people to your project then you describe your project and then you try to convince them that your project is special and then you detail how people can uh, interact with the project either contributing collaborating or using and then you state the resources that you need. There are other things that you can do that you can write on a readme. We discuss other points. Um, is that what you want me to come back to? Yeah, okay. So is this like kind of a general guide or like a standard? Is that like a standard format for writing um, the readme? Because that would help to even answer questions related to whether abstract so could be me or you what. Would yeah. You will be sent to a breakout room to actually do that. Uh, you're, oh. you're, you're thinking in the direction we want to take you. So we're very excited about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's take this hook <laughs> and let's go to breakout rooms. Maybe there are there other pressing questions? No. Okay. So will you give us a template to use in the, in the yes. breakout room? Yes. Okay, yes. Okay. Perfect. So Graciela, can you explain what activity oh, it is? Yes, it's actually not in breakout rooms, right? It's just self ref self reflection. Yeah, I can send them to breakout room where people have choice to actually move around the room. So if you are if you want to just work in a group, you can do that. But it's a self reflection. We do have a template that we can show you. Yeah. Uh, let me share the screen. I shouldn't have stopped sharing. <laughs> So this is a reproducible project template, and this is the readme of this uh, repository. You can use this template to write your own, but there's also, a, Malvika, there's a Google down, Doc, right? Yeah. Yes, there's a Google Doc, but I'll, if you scroll down this part, there is a copy button on the top right, you can see. Just the, just on the right, you see, no, just, just. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This yeah there, that. Yeah, there is a copy button on the right. So if you click on that, it will copy the template in a markdown. Um, but there is also a exact same thing written in a Google document, which is listed in this line number 294. Yeah, you can edit it to start writing and drafting your readme. Um, and then you, option uh, two, can you make? Yeah, if you're hosting your project in other platforms that are not GitHub, feel free to write a readme directly in the Google Doc and host it in your Google Drive or something. Um, and maybe link that back to your issue that you created two days ago, right, Malvika? So we can have all linked together about your project and we can take a look. Um, let's have... 10 minutes for that. Is that all right? Okay. I'll set a timer and put some music. Recording. So in this part, we will be doing a short breakout activity. I have, cre I have created a bunch of breakout room as usual. You would be able to switch room if you feel like you're in a room that is not correctly assigned to you. You should be able to see all the rooms and uh, figure out which room you want to go to. But each room would have about three people, two people if you're writing. And the instruction is just think about a time when collaborating or working on an open project was a complete train wreck. What happened? What made it chaotic? And the second scenario where think of a time when you were collaborating on a project where everything was great what happened and what made it sublime. Um, so a bit of reflection on your own experience. So we have created a room, it would be a 10 minutes discussion. Yes, Clotilde? Uh, yes, please. I, uh, I think that I speak in English and French, but it's, if it's about writing, I would prefer to have only French because actually when we have a break in room, sometimes we need to speak on most of the time in English. I would prefer really to have maybe only French. Okay. Yeah. Sure. You can edit back your name as FR and let me see if there are more people who can speak French. I do see that you're put in with Laura, who 
has she also speaks French actually, but sometimes we have another person who didn't speak French, which make the discussion only okay. in English. I will yeah. make sure that you have everyone uh, with the same room. Thank you. I actually have found three French speaking people. Um, and if you would like to go to that room, you should be able to see that and move as well. Okay, thanks mm. so much. Uh, to... Yeah, I'm here for the French speaking people. Sorry, so you can put me on. Yes, Alex, I put you with Laura and Clotilde. Thank you. I think it really helps that you. you have your name mm -hmm. edited. So thank you so much. All right, I'm going to open the room. Uh, I'm going to actually re reduce the time to eight minutes. We're slightly running over, and I want to make sure that you all have chance to learn about different things too. All right, enjoy your discussion. Chat. Yeah, it's always, it's always a... The time to get to know each other first and yeah. then now we have limited time to talk about what we need to talk to <laughs> we will have one more breakout and will not reshuffle you can go back to the same room oh okay right okay thank you the struggle the struggle is real um any reflection from your room would you like to share uh, some of the good or bad or ugly of collaboration um I'm going to actually ask people who have not spoken so far to try this time. Oluvatoin, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the things that um, I'm, we discussed in my breakout room is the fact that, um, well, one of the things that made um, collaborating or working with on open project chaotic was the fact that there was we had groups that there were no there was no clear cut instruction on what each person needed to do. No leadership. Everything was just all over the place. At the end of the day, the project was abandoned and we couldn't make a headway. But one of the things that made um, a collaboration that I worked on um, very successful and it was sublime was the fact that at the beginning, um, it was a study that we conducted. We had to work on the secondary data. And so we had already from the beginning set up the fact that you are working on this I'm going to do this and yeah, contributing on analysis. I'm doing things on discussion or some things like that. So everything was well delineated. So everybody worked on whatever they had to work on and it was a successful one. And we had our publication at the end of the day. I can completely relate with that. There's always a clear direction. There's always someone who's guiding and supporting and there's you know, a, a direction that ends with something that you all have done. I love that. Nadia. Uh, thank you. I have a question. Um, I actually think that I have never been involved in any open project uh, and that put lots of pressure on me from during my PhD. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering if, uh, yeah, I, I actually love to hear about different elements of an open project. For example, mm -hmm. I was involved in data gathering, but not in many other aspects of the project. For example, uh, we were not involved in choosing collaborators for working on a specific project together or article. I used to write an article on that data, but it was just me alone. And um, yeah, I, I, I actually like to see uh, mm. what are those elements for open projects. I know some of them, but I, I like to just have it like a summary. We have five calls planned on that. So if you would like a summary, I, I, first of all, I completely relate with what you're talking about. You know, early in my research, I definitely had projects where I had to work alone. I didn't feel like I had a choice because I didn't know any other. Um, I wonder what other people are thinking. Maybe Shay, do you think you what you'd want to say have somewhere related to that? Yeah. So I actually wanted to uh, highlight the um, discussion that we had in our breakout room. So one thing that I guess, like I mean, I personally had the experience of both of them, um, like both group. I mean, like which was successful and which was not that much and one thing that was that is very important i guess is um like to make sure who has what skills and what tasks is gonna be um, like basically assigned to them 
So if the tasks that are assigned to someone who does not have that skills and they want to develop it within a short amount of time, that's not feasible. So we always have to see like what's practical, what's not. And that really helps to the success of the uh, project, uh, I believe. And we actually talked about it. There should be like a brainstorming session at the first, assigning the roles, like make sure that the t- team dynamic is very well structured, these things. Thank you, Shay. Arne, and I'm, com- I'm gonna come back to Nadia's question, um, but Arne, please go ahead first. Yeah, okay, because I didn't finish my my um, uh, story to Moses and um, to Ducey. So this is my time, a chance. Okay, during uh, our onboarding, because I, my, uh project is dealing mostly with persons with disabilities like myself uh and so during the onboarding so they have different disabilities uh they come with caregivers or sometimes they forgot to charge the device attached to their wheelchair the transportation also was a struggle because we need to bring them in one place so it's really hard in the beginning, but eventually we learn. And then we we recruited one guy. We, we want them to just use the device in their daily activities, like going to church or shopping. There's one guy who <laughs> who is an outlier, and he went all the way going to different places, crossing all the intersections in the city <laughs> using the device. So his data is like way way beyond the others so yeah those are the struggles that uh, we face yeah that's that's it for me thank you for sharing that Arne um I I think so I work with colleagues who are trying to improve accessibility in some of the work we do and um, having those colleagues first of all having those colleagues is really valuable at the same time not putting the burden of decision on those colleagues to accommodate for their own accessibility is so important. And I completely understand why most of the projects could be total train wreck for people with disability of different kinds. So thank you for sharing that. Um, um, Graciely, do you wanna come back to Nadia's point, Nadia's question? Um, Aspects of open projects. Yeah, so as Malvika said, we have a lot of calls scheduled for that because that's a really extensive subject. And what we use to say to people is that open open science, it's kind of an umbrella and you have different ways or, or what, what's the other metaphor is a buffet. Buffet, buffet, buffet. of open yeah. science. And there's like a garden science. of open science too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So there are a lot of things you can do to make your project open and it has a gradient of completely close it to completely open and you don't need to to be completely open all the time. You can uh, take what you can take and open your project in different ways, the way that works best for you you and your project. Um, It can be a lot of work to have a complete open project because you need to manage community, manage the project, um, take care of license, everything. Um, so we, especially for people who never worked on open projects, we don't recommend being all open at once, like for the first time, try different things. You can, you know, read about licenses and start open, uh, putting open licenses on your product. So you write a, a paper and you, you know, you collect some data and you put assign an open license to it. Or you start using GitHub and making an open repository. Or um, what else? What are examples we can have? Um, you you start a community, you start inviting people to collaborate in your project. Um, those are all aspects of an open project that you can have your feet wet with (laughs) and and start trying experimenting and see what works for you and what does not Um, so the whole OLS is for you to experiment with that and to find out what works for you we hope you enjoyed the ride (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're going to have two community related calls, three open science calls. We're going to talk about open science, buffet, open science, umbrella, open science, garden, whatever metaphor works for you. And there is never an insistence that you should be doing everything. We, we completely understand how sometimes open science can add a lot of layer of responsibility. And we don't want you to be burned out and we don't want you to feel discouraged and don't think that you're we're trying to get you to do everything. Frank, did you have a hand up for a second and then you took it down? No, I'm good. Okay, great. Graciela, should we take a few moments to actually just like breathe a bit and get people to like relax and touch on the point why we're showing all of these? <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, so let's uh, like chat a little bit, <laughs> dance and pet, pet the pets. <laughs> um, so are we having that conversation about the whole why we're doing yeah. this? Yeah, um, so we, Movik and I were talking and we want to reassure you that as it, it might seem overwhelming, we had a, but a lot of calls together and there are a lot of tasks for you so far, we want to make sure that you know that none of those tasks are tasks are mandatory. We are not going to evaluate you. Um, it, it's for you. It's a tool for you for for your clarity of mind um, on your own time. Take the time to go through them and do whatever you can do. And things that you find difficulties with, you can always bring it to us or your mentor. You're going to have a lot of weeks to work on them. You don't need to get them ready right now. We are pushing a little bit for you to get to know these tools now because they will be useful for you throughout the, the, the OLS program. Um, so uh, we want to for you to take some moments on these calls this week for, like, you know, get started, get to know the tools and try a little bit of everything so you know kind of where you're going to struggle more and what is going to be most useful for you and then you can start next week already with some guidance for and, and questions to bring to your mentor when you're going to meet them um don't feel pressured at all to be perfect <laughs> At, at, especially at this first week, um, we are showing you these tools. A lot of things is are new for you. Um, it's okay, and it's very different. I, I understand it's very different from what we used to do in academia. So take your time, relax, play your playlist, <laughs> and spend some time after the call just going through the tools and reading the materials, just getting familiarized with the language, with the uh you know the way of thinking and uh, chat with each other about those things and you know just we're not here to judge you <laughs> we also talked about how people and we need to acknowledge that you all are trying to advocate for equity diversity inclusion accessibility and often they are driven by people who are experiencing themselves and we shouldn't forget the amount of workload that you already have so we are not here to make your life difficult we want to hold this space where you can ask questions we can give you some tools that we have found useful that can help you scope your project so you don't feel like there's too much to do you can be you know you can hold the responsibility for how little or how much you can do with the time you have rather than trying to do everything. So please hold the self-compassion to yourself that you're doing a lot. And none of these conversations we're having is to evaluate you. We want you to enjoy the conversation. We want you to be critical about the conversation. We want you to challenge us, challenge each other. You all have so much experience. If we don't create opportunity for you to share with each other, we're going to lose out so much knowledge that this room has. So we are here to also learn from you. Please do not think that we are, we want you to feel inadequate. Or we want you to finish everything that we're telling you to do during the call. It's a bit of mistake from my side that we have 
we said like let's like, let's get started and i know that how much you want to dig into the deep of it and it's not possible in 10 minutes so just take dirty ugly notes go back and clean them up all right i'm going to give you a quick chat about the license open license we'll take a quick break come back continue our conversation on community participation guideline and code of conduct those two are massive topics and these are extremely important as we start working open. Before I move on, any question, any unaddressed things that we have in the room? Okay, all good. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen as usual. All the slide decks are linked on the from a pad. And while it's opening, there you go. Right, my disclaimer. Uh, Ijoma, do you want to go ahead? Yes, just a quick question. Yes, so I, know, I know that the slides, the slide links are, are there in the pharma pad, but when you click on it, I don't know, maybe it's it's for my, maybe I, I'm not that tech competent, but I'm not able to download them. Right, so, I can just view them on my browser. So do you have, yeah. I know for yesterday, you shared the slide deck. So is that something that we should expect each day? Yes. So okay. we will be publishing all of them. We want to do what we are telling you to do, right? So we want to publish them on Zenodo, get a DOI, which is a digital object identifier, and then put it on our website. So you would always find them there and you would also find them Zenodo. We, we will also be sharing the Google Doc directly on Zenodo. Um, and honestly, these documents are here. You can always come back and use them and... Um, yeah, all of those are, are your things to read and reshare. So anything you need, ask for us, uh, ask us for that. I'm losing my language. It's only 7 p.m. here. Okay, let's okay, move on. <laughs> so we're going to talk about open license. License is generally speaking a technical term and also a legal document. And these documents are written by lawyers. I am not a lawyer. So my knowledge about legal aspects of open source is limited, but it's good enough that I have survived some of my life uh, talking about open source. So if you if there are many technical questions, we will take them, bring it back to people who are actual lawyer if um, something that we discuss here isn't enough. Motivation, why are we talking about open license? So there, there are a bunch of license you can learn about, but we're gonna focus only on open license. And the reason for that is that we want you to understand that again, sharing anything on, on online doesn't make it open. You need to be intentional about if you're sharing with others, how do they use it, remix it, or share your work. And the method is to apply an open license that allows them to use remix and share. There are some common misconceptions. People think that, oh, I put it on the internet, so isn't it open? I wrote a blog about it, isn't it open? I just created a GitHub, isn't it open? Technically it is, but how do people know how to use your work or how to credit you, how to attribute that they learned from you or that they can actually rebuild on it without getting sued? Sharing work with a license also doesn't give away your copyright. You can still publish and sell your work. So we will talk a little bit about that, but um, we were having this conversation in the very beginning where someone said that I am afraid of sharing my thing because what if my idea gets stolen? You can share your idea, you can put your name on it and you can attach a license. That license can require people to be honest about where they found that information in the first place. And you can also have an open source license and build a company and earn money. So none of those are uh, you know, separate conversation. And also using work shared with an open license without attribution can be legal. So what you can say, but people are not required to use my work and not you know, say that they found it from me. It is illegal if you, if you put a license and, and if people have used your work, it's their legal obligation to credit you. And also ethically, it's wrong from academic perspective. We need to acknowledge our collaborator and peers who have worked really hard to build something. So if we are gonna use their work, we should credit them. So there are you know, two kinds of typical license you can see. So a lot of us develop documentation, but then a lot of us also develop software or code. 
Uh, but both of them have the same thing. So you can have a very, very closed license for software, which is proprietary or copyright in case of um, documentation, or you can have on the other end, it's on the public domain. I am very altruistic. I'm going to let people use and I don't want them to do anything about it. Um, the same in the public, uh, public domain. So people don't need to attribute where they got the information. A lot of time in open science, open source, we focus on something in the middle. Um, so we want to have enough permission so other people can use it. They know that you have permitted to use it with certain condition. And the condition could be that they need to attribute you or they need to use the same kind of license, which is copy left. In documentation, it's somewhat sim similar, but there's a bit more range in here, um, which I would talk about in a moment. So there are three aspects of open license. First, that when you share something, you should allow people to use it. That's the basic. The second one is that if they can use it and they find a problem in it, they can modify it, but also they can add a new feature or make it better. That's the modification. Or they can take your work and apply it in their own work, which has slightly different problem. And the third one is share it. It's one thing to say, I can use it and I can modify it. If they love what they created with the modification, they would like their community to benefit and therefore they should be able to share it. But they can also just share the exact software that you have developed or exact document you have written. So think about open source software. For example, it should be freely used, should be freely modified and freely shared with anyone. In the documentation, you can have uh, different layers of what kind of attribution people give. So we're looking at this, the middle part of it, right? So you can have first, which is, for example, CC by 4.0, which requires people to attribute you. That's the compulsory credit. Sometimes some people don't want their work to be used by a commercial entity. So they can put a license, which is CC by 4.0 NC, NC is non-commercial, where people can use your work, but they can't make money out of it. Like they cannot sell your work. You can have non-derivatives. For example, they can use your work in the exact form that you have developed. This is where it gets a bit non-modifiable, right? And then another one is if I allow you to change it, repeat with the same license that I have used. So this is share alike. My personal preference is always to go with just attribution. I would be, I would like people to be able to make money if they can with my work. I'd be a little bit pissed, but I don't want to limit that for different companies to use my work. Um, but these become too restrictive for me. But I know there are other organizations that actually do like using non-derivative and share alike. So you need to think about what is your preference. And often I think to myself when I choose a license, why, what is the purpose? that I'm choosing a restrictive license. What can a restrictive license save for me that is so important for me that I don't want other people to have? There are many kinds of license. Now this is like opening a box of new jargon and te terminology. So in software, you can have, uh, so we are again in the middle of these, right? You have public domain, you have proprietary, you have copyleft and permissive. So this is the different spectrum that we are talking about. So when we talk about copy, uh, let's start with permissive. Permissive is very similar to CC by 4.0. You can use my work, but you should credit me. Um, you can use license like Apache, BST, or MIT. You can have copy left, which can have non-commercial uh, non or non-derivative kind of element. So you can use license like GNU, Mozilla, or Eclipse public license. All of them are slightly different, but they can be loosely categorized into two. If you use GitHub, you can actually have direct uh, template to this license so you can apply them. And I'll show you a little glimpse of it. And if we have time at the end of the call, you can also try it yourself. Okay, so as an academic, we really care about attribution, right? And in, in that sense, you would like to choose what kind of license I should be using. So in the non-copy left, which means permissive, non-reciprocal, meaning that they, they are not required to use the same license as you have used. You would be able to use CC BY for document. You can use MIT or BST for software. And the copy left 
would be things like CC by share alike, which is slightly restrictive. You can use GPL or MPL. There is public domain where there is no copyright holder. So if you ever use Wikimedia, Wikipedia, a lot of them are just shared under CC0 because people who've created the knowledge, they don't want to be attributed or they don't care about being attributed. Whereas there are a few um, uploads on Wikipedia, Wikimedia, they might be CC by 4.0. Okay, but there are problems. There are wrinkle number one, copyleft and derivative work. So you have copyleft, which means reciprocal or viral, open license that require all derivative work to be shared with the same license. So we already talked about it. And then you have non-copyleft, open license that do not require derivative to be shared with the same license. So you can have the same terminology used. For example, we talk about attribution. So these are just, a bit more um, jargon that I'm adding to your dictionary. The wrinkle number two, patent. We hear a lot about patents. It's not equal to copyright. If you've created something, you are the copyright holder. Um, a lot of time, for example, if you work for an organization, that organization has given you a contract and their contract says that everything that you produce while being employed by them, the copyright is not yours. The copyright is organization's. So that, that's one way to say that that means that copyright include copying, modify, modifying and redistributing. However, if you have something that let's say copyright is owned by the organization, but you have shared it with open license, copyright is not that important anymore because someone can share like it, share work with CC by 4.0. It doesn't matter who the copyright holder is. You have the permission to reuse that work. But the patent allows you to sell your uh, idea with certain money or, or whatever that might be. Open source software license may or may not contain clause explicitly granting patent rights. So you, if you select a license and at some point you wanna convert your document or convert your work or discovery into patent, you need to be careful about what license you put. And if you plan to patent your software and defend your patent, you should talk to a lawyer. Then, then my knowledge starts to reduce in how I can help you. So how to apply license? It's very simple. Just like that you created a readme file, you can create a file called license, all capital, where you can put a, a text that someone, a lawyer, a bunch of lawyers who have created for you. So CC BY comes from Creative Commons. Um, I hope you would actually meet people from Creative Commons who uh, we have very um, good relationship with in terms of that they are based in Canada and we have uh, invited them to speak to you at, at one of the calls. And in that, CC BY is completely nonprofit. They work with lawyer to create resources so other people can use it. And you are not required to write this from scratch like in the README. So you can go to, um, you can literally Google CC by 4.0 and you would find a document that you can copy and put. And, and we'll show you how to do that as well. Same for software, you have MIT um, that you can copy. You have, you know, if you go for a bit more restrictive, you can use Mozilla. All of these documents are written. And once you have added a license, put a link in, in, in your readme where you can say my work is licensed under this kind of license. This means that if you use my work, attribute it or whatever you would like. I hope from the beginning it was clear that a code uses different kind of license, a document uses different kind of license and data uses different kind of license. Meaning that if you have a project where you have all the three kinds of thing, you have to select license for each of the elements. So you have to describe that software produced in my project will be shared under MIT, creative work or writing or documentation will be shared under CC BY or and the data would be sh shared under um, CC0. Okay, so you can come back to this as a reference, um, the slide deck, and I'm gonna sk skip to the part where you do actually get to see how to put license. If you create a new repository, you have often the chance to select license and um, you can click on that and it gives you like a bunch of options and you can select from that. Another is that if you already have a license, you can write this word, big capital license, and it will create a button on the right immediately that says choose a license. If you click on the choose the license, it will give you a bunch of options that you can select from. 
TLDR, if you were not listening to what you but what we said the whole time because it was too much, what we are saying is that there are two simple steps to make your work open. Putting things online does not make it open, but describing what your project is and why is it open, plus adding an open license does make your work open. When you talk about open license, think about does my license allow other people to use, modify, or share my work? You should be using different license for different outcomes. These are some of our recommendation. All right, there are lots of resources. Um, and I know that that was a lot of new thing for people who are not used to license. So we should have a bit of discussion about what questions you have and if you have any specific re recommendation for license from your own organization. Yes, Oluwatoin. Thank you so much, Malvika. Uh, it was really an um, an eye opening session. Um, you you answered some of the questions I wanted to ask about um, having to have have permission to use whatever you put on there and putting a caveat, for example, attributing um, things to you. But I just wanted to find out that in the spirit of the open source. Does it negate if I have to say that anytime someone wants to use my data, they must ask for permission for, for me? Does that mean I'm not making my work open? No, that's and then not, not Sorry, okay. go ahead, finish your question. Okay, and then one more question. You talked about modification of your um, data. So I was just wondering, mm -hmm. um, is it um, important that that kind of modification must be approved by the originator mm -hmm. of the idea? Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you for that question. I, I think a lot of things that I was saying was mostly about software and documentation and not so much about data because we will talk about open data in one of the coming weeks. And open data would be um, where we, we can spend a bit more time on what is called open and open data. Am I allowed to modify data? Most likely most data you should not be modifying. You need to have a raw data and it should be stored somewhere. And you can share some of your data in the dedicated place. So, but just going back to first question, you said, if I don't share my data, am I not being open? Is it enough to say that you need permission? Actually, sharing data openly without consideration is very irresponsible. So we actually want you to think about um, if certain pieces of data should not be made open. So. As much as I will advocate for software and documentation to be open, as open as possible, I would want you to think about data differently. Specifically in your case, it's not unusual um, that in, for example, I come from bioinformatics background. A lot of the research that I did, the data needs to be deposited in a dedicated repository and there needs to be an access code for it. And whoever accesses this data needs to be authorized to access the data. Um, so for data, there is a lot more restriction. Um, for example, I don't know if you all are aware of Hugging Face. Hugging Face is an open platform where people uh, share uh, large language models openly. And the data that is used to build these models cannot be just simply accessed by anyone. They need to have an uh, agreement made with the organization uh, and agree to that access. So this is, I think it's called CLA, Contributors License Agreement, which is a little bit too difficult for me to explain. I don't use that a lot, but it's not, not unusual that you would have a different condition for different kinds of data. Um, just want to finish with like, you know, particularly this group has a lot of people who are working with indigenous data or population data or human genetics data those data should not be made open uh, without proper safeguarding or guardrails. But yeah, the statement is important. Then you can just say, I'm not sharing data because I'm working with X kind of data. If you want to access it, we would require you to share, I don't know, why, you, why do you want it? What do you want to do with it? What is the responsibility you're going to take and so on? I hope that, I hope that answers. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Marvita. You're welcome. Um, Elham? Uh, thanks for the information, it really helps. I, I wanna know more about uh, the, for example, as you said that you worked in bioinformatics, 
for example, if we want to share a kind of data set of um, biological data of people with kind of disease or disorder, uh, this should have a license for data, yeah? And how we should proceed to get this license? Mm. Uh, Graciela, do you have a response to that? Um, <laughs> not quite. I know that one option that you have is to anonymize your data before sharing it, depending on how your data is structured. That could be an option. Um, yeah, I, I, I think those data things, it should be think case by case. It depends a lot on what's the nature of your data, where you're planning to share it. Is it like research? Are you sharing it with the paper or, you know? Um, so I would consult with a librarian at the university. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good prompt. Uh, each organization have different guidelines and legal requirement to storing their data. In Germany, people can't destroy their data for 10 years. And that is <laughs> stored by people in libraries. So do not, do not share data anywhere else because librarians are the right people. Um, and one more thing that you would do afterwards is that there's a F1000 recommendation for data sharing. And as Graciely was saying that if you choose a particular journal, that journal have a specific requirement for where the data should sit. So sometimes it's also uh, better not to share data before you have figured where you're gonna publish them because mm -hmm. it, may, it may mean that you end up having date, same data in two locations with two separate identifier and kind of loses the provenance as in like, where does the date, where did this data come from? Data is a little bit more complicated to explain with license compared to software and documentation. And we would definitely come back to it in actually two of the calls, one on um, open data, open science, and there would be also FAIR principle. And some of you are also working with CARE principle where you know when you can't share a data, you at least describe a metadata and you share that metadata saying that what does what kind of information did I collect in what format so if someone else is working in the same field then they can decide if they should be contacting you or not so you can't just say data uh, available upon request um, you probably can't make everyone's request uh, you can't grant access to everyone but at least sharing metadata helps a lot so it depends that uh, I want to share this data set with other or for example, I give this responsibility to an organization or for example, a journal. Yeah, because, because for example, we see lots of data sets, uh, for example, in genome sequence or faces or iris or many factors of biological of human. And yeah, I was a little bit curious about how mm -hmm. the license. Mm -hmm. so okay. When I was publishing paper, um, I was asked to submit my transcriptomics data in GenBank. And I think it's gene expression something, forgot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you would have recommendation for where to submit data because also journals have requirement to store and secure data and they don't want to have multiple repository. Um, so definitely follow the guideline from your field, from the, from the librarian should be your best friend. And they would love that you go and talk to them because they know everything. I'm gonna read the question by Renee on the chat. Could you expand on how licensing would work if your project includes open source code from a project that was not created by you? That's an excellent question. Uh, I'm sure Graciely, you have used that before. Um... How could you expand on how licensing works? Your project includes open source code from a project that was not created by you. Yeah, um, in my work, for example, it's common. We have a R package that cites every other package that we use. That's a good practice that we try to build among researchers in ecology, at least. <laughs> um, so yeah, you can always, um, but then how you license your software if there are other packages being involved in your own software, I think you need to consult their own, their, the license for each of the packages that you're uh, including in your software and then 
cite them and depend like there are these shell like license um so you need to kind of find a middle ground sometimes i haven't published software with this particular mm. problem but that's how i see it <laughs> Yeah, I think the dependency file is definitely one which you were saying, Graciela, like collect information of all the dependencies you're using and, and credit them somewhere, very similar to how you would cite a paper that, you know, that builds on other papers. And if, I think if your question was about mixed licensing, where let's say most of them use CC by 4.0 or MIT, and then one of them uses Mozilla and that requires you to have same derivative, that's a complicated one. Then you need to consider... Um, is it worth using <laughs> that software or is there other more permissive uh, that allows you to actually not worry about the same software usage? Um, I want to go to Ajitesh and then come to Ijeoma. And Elham, I think that's your hand from previous one, right? Okay, go for it, Ajitesh and then Ijeoma. Hi, so I had a question. So if we start our project with an open license, but later on the priorities of the project changes and we want to consider using a more like restrictive license. What kind of challenges would that bring? That's an excellent question. Um, it has happened a lot in the real world where people begin open and at some point they find money and they close it and open AI is one of them. Um, but then I'm not saying that everyone is like open AI. This, there could be many, many uh, cases, but the copy that is, let's say, let me give you an example. If I decided to create an, a package in 2015 and in 2018, I was like, I, I don't want it open. I want to close it. I have to freeze my last edit as the last openly published software. And from that point on, I can close my software and any additional feature that I develop should not be used by anybody else. But anything that I published before that freezing moment is still available for public for use. So you can't really take back what you did before. Uh, it's available to the public. And a lot of time you would use things like Wayback Machine or other archiving places where uh, people can always find a copy. But it's both possible. And it's also possible the other way around where you might have closed your software and at some point you decided, well, I, I just want to open it. And there are many, many examples of that as well. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you. There are many software packages you'll find. I don't know if you any of you have used Scikit-Learn. Scikit-Learn is doing different thing. Like they are completely open from the beginning, but they are changing their model to become self-sustainable. So there is a part of it where they are trying to commercialize it without making it inaccessible for academics. So you can also have examples where you have dual license, where you have one kind of license that's available for academics and other kind of license that company needs to pay money for, which is fair enough. Right, yeah. <laughs> Ijeoma? Yes, thank you so much for this um, wonderful insights. I wanted to say something about the data, right? So when sure. it comes to sharing data and also thinking from ethic, the ethical perspective, there I don't see at any point or like any circumstance that personal identifying information especially when it comes to health data should ever be shared, right? So one of the guiding principles is to de-identify data, even when you're working with collaborators, even in your team, not even just for open source, you should de-identify the data, remove every personal identifiers. And sometimes when we think about that, we, we think it's just the names, but then it can also be more than the names. It can go as far as the, the date of birth and and uh, some other identifying information like even the postal code and stuff like that. So that that's what I, I wanted. I, I think data, making data open is a huge issue. And also coming from the ethics perspective, um, there's some kind of health data or some kind of populations that you don't want to share their data even if the data is anonymized or, or de-identified. 
So some vulnerable populations, you don't want to share their data. And then there's also um, data governance that we need to think about. So for indigenous data, there's, there's governance on how their data can be used. And, and that's not something I'm not, I'm not, I don't have expertise there, but I know that they are guiding principles. And then even for using black data now, there's also principles for, for that kind of data. So even though journals would want you to deposit the data somewhere in one repository, I, from my experience, I've actually never shared the data because some of the populations that I work with are not populations you want to share data. Just like sometimes we have very good intentions, but then maybe we even publish the results of our study and it brings some, it either brings um, or widens the equity gap or even stigmatizes a group of people. So these are also some of the things to think about when when thinking about making data open. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, in fact, the, the FAIR and CARE principle are very aligned to what you're saying. Uh, one thing to say that I would I would not just have the default of don't share data, right? But we need to consider what kind of data are we talking about and what could happen as a result of sharing or not sharing it. And what you were just saying, I completely understand if the data is coming from minority population, you want to protect them, but you can still share metadata of what kind of information was collected, who were involved, who holds the data and where data is currently stored. Um, so transparency in data could mean very different from transparency in software because you want to be able to reproduce your own result, right? Like else everybody, in fact, there have been a lot of cases where fraudulent papers have been published where people claim to have collected data where they didn't. And when someone asked for their data, they were either non-existent or fabricated. So think about ethical consequences. Are, am I really right at saying this? Can someone actually find out enough information about my research without exposing data. All right, folks, we are very, very close to the last part. And I want us to like, just spend like five minutes quietly um, in doing a self-reflection. So in the line 328, uh, can you please, this is gonna be interesting with share document. You could also use the chat if you prefer, add your name and just take five minutes to think about what kind of outputs you expect to come out of your project. And should you be considering open license for all of them? Um, I'll put the timer five minutes and come back. Okay, whoever is gonna edit this video, we're gonna insert a code of conduct video here because we just had a big conversation on code of conduct. And now we're opening space for a conversation. So Tilda. Uh, yes, um, I think that how when we will speak about license and um, right now all the thing was about GitHub. My question was when I we create a video because I create a lot of content and also about my project, I also plan to create a video. Mm -hmm. How we, okay, the video is open, it's on YouTube, but at that moment, because like you said before, uh, it's not because it is open mean that you create the open source or something like that. And when we create a video, how we make it clear that it is open? In YouTube, you can you actually have option to include open license like CC BY. All the OLS videos are openly shared. You yeah. CC BY 4.0 license. So video is is considered creative outcome, and you can use the similar license as we discussed for documentation. Okay, yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Any question on contributors guideline and code of conduct? I'm gonna see who hasn't spoken so far. Um, yes, Vincent, go ahead. Ijom, I will come to you later. I asked a question in the chat and it's basically, you mentioned there are contribution guidelines and code of conduct. Is there a difference between those two? And if, if there is, what is it exactly? Yeah, um, they are generally spoken in the same sentence, but you're right, they are different. Uh, the contributing guideline generally focuses on how people can contribute. Uh, what are the steps to contribution? Where are different places they can contribute? What kind of contributions? 
In code of conduct, you generally talk about when you are engaging with the community. It doesn't have to be just contribution, but let's say if you are coming in and working with this community, what are some acceptable or unacceptable behavior? And what are the consequences of unacceptable behavior? Um, this is, we, you can sometimes write all both of them together, but you know, code of conduct just doesn't apply to the contributors. It applies to the project lead as well, which is why in the beginning of the call, Krasili said that if you find something we do, you can reach out to someone who can punish me. And punishment in this case would mean to you know, make me aware that I did something that wasn't acceptable and make me reflect on how would I do something differently. Um, so code of conduct, uh, so I am part of the Carpentries code of conduct and we operate uh, independent of the leaders of the community because we want to be able to handle reports made against the leaders as well. If I may add to that, uh, you can think of a code of conduct as something that you can use for everyone involved in the project in the sense of even the users. So if you're hosting a training, um, you can use the code of conduct to ask people to be nice to each other and things like that. And the contribution guidelines will be exclusively to people who want to contribute content to your workshop, for example. Okay, well, keep it very quick, uh, Ijuma and then Clotilde. So I had a question in the chat, so I wanted to draw your attention to it. Okay. How do you deal with compensation for the contributors? Some people may expect some form of compensation if they contribute. We're going to have a lot of conversation on recognition, attribution, um, but just to like say that the compensation could look very different to different people. Meaning, meaning of um, what is valued is different. So sometimes asking, you know, uh, what would be the best compensation for you? And sometimes it could be, oh, I want to um, be acknowledged in the work that I have contributed to your work. And a lot of time you should. And we would actually show you some really great example for how people do acknowledgement. Um, but in some cases, it could also mean that people need money because their time is valuable and they are investing time with you. Um, and also knowing that not everyone can do everything. So that's a very big question, Juma, and I'm very excited for us to talk about it uh, in one of the future calls. And is that something that you should include, even in the statement of it, section? in the contributors guideline yet? So in the Turing way, we have written a document called acknowledgement process, uh, which is part of our policy. And in the acknowledgement process, we describe how we acknowledge different kinds of contribution. Um, and yeah, you can actually put it in the same or you can just build a different document. So you don't have to bulk up the same document with all kinds of information. You can always build different kinds of document which are very specific. Um, Clotilde, do you wanna go next? Uh, I think my question was was really close because, like Rosella say, I try to invite people sometimes to create video, uh, but the question just always comes out about what did I want to have at the end or something like that. When at the beginning I tried to explain just to create the video about uh, outreach of mathematics, I think that at the beginning sometimes people say, "Oh, okay, I accept," but after many months, so I see that just people. Just, start to just say like oh that is not really profitable i don't know how but my question would be only about how to encourage people to just say you can create the video and keep them motivated i think that that is right. maybe another deal like people come and you need to find something really interesting for them to motivate them to continue to work free i don't know how to explain that but we have two calls on just that, how to build a okay. community that encourages people's contribution. So I'm, I know people have to drop in a minute. So I'm just going to quickly take one minute to show that there are some things you would be. Thank you so much, Grassili, for taking some notes. So um, after this call in the next weeks, next days, please uh, go through some of the next steps. If you have started working on your README, please start you know, making them uh, shareable. Select, select license for your repository, start creating code of conduct. Code of conduct can take multiple months because sometimes you need to get approval from all people involved. 
So for a single project where you're the only responsible person, you can add a code of conduct in a day. But if you're working with multiple people, you need their permission. So don't think about these as being that it's going to happen tomorrow. This is something that you should get started because these are the important steps to make your project open. Um, thank you so much for being here for, for another three hours. But going forward, we wouldn't have this long workshops. We would have cohort calls, which are hour and a half, and uh, you'll have more time for reflection and conversation. Um, thank you so much, Gracieli, for spending so much time with me in, in designing, delivering this. And uh, you can reach out to both of us on Slack or email. Any last word, Gracieli? Um, no, I think that's it. Uh, enjoy your me mentor me team meetings next week. Uh, yes. And we're here for you. We're going to stay for a, a few more minutes if you have any other questions. And you can reach out to us on Slack or by email. We're here to support you. <laughs> Have a lovely rest of your day.